taking part in the 2018 Brassus Valley Business Forum. Please enjoy this breakout session replay recorded by Water to Wine Productions. This video is presented in part by the Bank and Trust. Howdy after lunch. It's an intimate soiree this afternoon. That's good. That tells me we've got the individuals in here that either want to know more about what is economic development and or want to be able to say, hey, we might want to start doing this. So without that, let me just introduce myself quickly. Uh, at points, you may think that this presentation, you're drinking from a fire hose. Uh, when Matt and the team asked me to present, they said, let the group know what is economic development, what are the benefits of economic development, and so this will be presented from the standpoint some of you have, again, a baseline of what it is. I hope to enhance your awareness. Some of you may be just, hey, I've never heard anything about this and I'd like to learn more about it, and I'm glad that you're here because you're each community ambassadors. So with that, I'm Lisa Mutchler. I'm with the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service here in College Station, Texas. And I direct the Economic and Workforce Development Programs at TEKS. So in that role, I have the privilege to work statewide with communities both urban and rural in size. And we facilitate everything from strategic plans to comprehensive plan updates. Likewise, we also coordinate the Basic Economic Development course, which is a 32-hour course uh, up to three times a year. This is my, my allergies that y'all hear are uh, compliments of Arlington, Texas. That's where I was last week. So with that, you're welcome to stop me as we go. If you have any questions, it's very informal. And thank y'all for uh, taking time to learn more about economic development. So our goals for our short amount of time together today, of course, are what, your, what are the economic development essentials? What are the basics? Likewise, the importance of developing a community profile, and this is a nice dovetail, as you heard earlier this morning, how the website and having the economic index uh, reports coming out monthly, you'll see the benefits of having that uh, in, your, in your community profiles. We'll also talk about the components and the tools of economic development, which include business retention and expansion. It also includes strategic marketing and budget planning. Likewise, it also includes business recruitment, business attraction, those terms are used interchangeably, and those corresponding incentives and programs that go along with those. So, our objective, raise leaders' awareness of local and regional economic development and activities in your Texas community. So, let's go. All righty. So, there's a lot of different definitions of economic development that are out there and in place. However, one that we tend to always rely upon and go back to time and time again is this definition in front of you. To attract, create, retain, and reinvest wealth within a specific geographic area. Doesn't sound like, oh, that's not a big deal, but wait, you're going to learn more here. So, the easiest way, I'm a picture person, you know, I'm a doer, I'm a tactile learner. And so, one way to understand what is economic development Consider it a house, and in that house you have to lay foundation, obviously, lay sheetrock, put up your walls. And so with that in mind, there are two pieces to, the, to get to the roof in order to build your house. You have community development and business development. And we're going to talk about those components. Likewise, then the overarching roof or umbrella is economic development. So, all righty. What are components of economic development in your communities? There's two sides, as you saw, and I know I'm going through this quick. You've got your two walls that hold up your roof. And on the left side, the community development. What is, what, how are you grooming your next leaders? We heard about that uh, earlier today in a lot of different sessions that I think it was a community engagement session where a lot of us now that we're looking at moving on and if we've done our jobs right, we have a newer, slicker, more technologically advanced uh, generation that's coming on board to carry the torch and make it even bigger and brighter. And so with that though, what kind of leadership development programs do you have in your community? Are they formal? And we've heard, we've heard a lot of people visit about 
Rotarians, Kiwanas. Also, they can be youth. Uh, you can have, I know in Brazos County, and I know some of the surrounding counties in our Brazos Valley uh, region, they also have leadership programs for youth. But of course, you have those uh, that are also forming leaders at 4-H, FFA, things of that nature. So that's a very important component of business development to have in order to perform economic development. Likewise, social infrastructure. What is the capacity of your health and human services? Do you have the right, do you have large enough schools, quality education, hospitals, healthcare? All of that uh, comes back up under social infrastructure. And that, as we know, that is critical because we don't want to be as at status quo bill, I think. And so with that though, workforce development, who's heard this term over and over again? It is critical. A lot of the groups that I run around in now, they're like economic development equals workforce development. And that is a true statement. And we know that as employers and also those who are looking for those skilled employees. So that is very critical in order to hold up your house under the economic development um, roof. And then of course the physical in infrastructure. We feel it all the time. If, new, if there are a new residential section coming in, uh, visitors coming into town, if we don't have the infrastructure to support that community, you've got to be able to adjust and make those adaptations so that you're gonna be able to have enough or if not, contractors leave, they'll go find another community that does have that planned growth and all, that, all those good areas. On the other side of Economic Development's house is the business development wall, if you will. And it is comprised of, most people say that's just traditionally three. A lot of us in the economic development arena, we say it's four. We've got entrepreneurialism. Those are really, those are your heart and soul small businesses. They don't suffer fools easily and they're not gonna give it up and, they're, and we want to ensure in the economic development arena that we are assisting them so that they can make a go of it and that they can be an actual uh, owner that uh, has a growing, flourishing uh, business. Likewise, retention expansion taking care of your homegrown. Those right there, we know right now, a lot of you in this community, y'all are already existing employers, and we thank you. We thank you very much, because if we didn't have you, trust me, why would any new large prospect want to even consider the Brazos Valley? They wouldn't. They're gonna look at how well are you taking care of your homegrown. So that in of itself is a very critical component of economic development under the business development side of the house, if you will, that wall. Also attraction, a lot of individuals relate to it as business recruitment. We all know that everybody wants to get, you know, the next whatever it is. Uh, if it's a, a sports team, something of that nature, of course I know that's the large urban areas, but they're always trying to get that next, next big box store or manufacturer with over 100 jobs. Trust me, those are actually, out of the ordinary and not the norm. And then the fourth one, as I indicated, a lot of old school economic developers are like, tourism is not economic development. Oh yes it is. It's the purest form of economic development. And why is that? Because you actually, you have individuals that are coming into your community for a very short amount of time. They're infusing a lot of money into your community and then they leave. They go home on Sunday or Monday, whatever the case may be. And in a, believe it or not, some communities, that is their only form of revenue is tourism. So I would think in the Brazos Valley proper, you, we have a good mix. We always need to be continuing. How do we continue to expand our existing employers and be able to attract our new employers? And also, of course, uh, with that in of itself, uh, take care of those small businesses, entrepreneurs, and then of course, tourism. Okay, so quickly, I just want you to, I'm going the wrong way with this fancy. Okay, here we go now. So these are the, I call them the walls, the foundation, community development, business development, and then your roof of economic development. So you're going to say, well, what is this EDC? We kept hearing everybody up there saying all these acronyms this morning, and it stands for an Economic Development Corporation. And you may say, well, how did those come about? Well, in 1979, the Texas State Legislature, in their infinite wisdom, they created, they passed the Development Corporation Act. And that act allowed the creation 
of Economic Development Corporations in Texas, and that allows you to, uh, these corporations to promote the creation of new and expanded industries, likewise creating and retaining your primary jobs. Also, it is funded by local sales tax and use tax, and it also provides oversight of your municipality. In, in a nutshell, that just means these EDCs operate with the board of directors who serve at the pleasure of the city council. Now, you've heard type A, what, and type B. There's two types of economic development corporations in Texas, and we're gonna talk about the characteristics of each. Some communities only have one, some communities have both, and some communities have neither. But it works for them, so just letting you know what is a type A EDC. By default, they are much more structured in nature, and they're, in other words, they don't have the same type of flexibility that you'll see here shortly that the type B uh, economic development corporations have. However, and I don't want to read to you, you can see that their overall goal, of course, is to increase sales tax to promote the industrial development, those two primary job creations and retentions. And these are just a few examples of what those type of projects that a type A corporation can uh, be able to fund. Obviously, manufacturing, the R&D, uh, always be aware that if we've had, for those communities that may have military bases or uh, airports that they need to extend or seaport facilities, Type A can fund those type of projects. So also operation of light rail. And Type B, like I said, these are just di characteristics are different. Type A can fund Type B projects with voter approval. Are y'all confused yet? Because there's so much to this. So it makes you have a new appreciation of anything for all of those individuals you know, both professionally and personally, that work in economic development. So that is what a type A corporation have. Do we have any of our region or within the region or without, outside of the Brazos Valley region that are a type A EDC? Nope, all righty. Now, the characteristics type B. That was established after type A that is, that their intent, they have a lot more flexibility and leeway to be able to fund projects that at times people say, oh, that, they're just making the city pretty. No, it's definitely more than that. They just, again, it was created, and again, the overall intent is to, of course, increase your sales tax to promote the civic and the commercial projects. These are just a few of the type projects that can be funded with that, of course, you know, public parks, sports, entertainment facilities, and Type B, the, the good news about a Type B and the reason it is very popular in Texas is that this type corporation, they can do all Type A eligible projects, whereas Type A, as I said, is much more structured by design, and then when Type B was put into place by the legislature, it allows a lot more flexibility. And oh, I forgot to ask, whoops, 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 me and my clicker. Are there any communities in here that have a type B? Okay, we have two. It looks like city of Navasota. All righty, all righty. And who else? Oh, Navasota. Okay, great. All righty. Well, so far, does that, that make sense, right? That's what y'all are doing. Okay, all righty. Let's talk about a little bit of, you know, state legislature created this. However, they need oversight of this of this um, sales tax use and how are we going to grow our community? How are we gonna make it a, the best place to live and have planned growth and not become status quoville? And that obviously, the EDC boards, I just wanted to put a comparison up here for you to let you know the composition and the way that they are structured. And as you can see, type A, minimum of five board members, uh, no more than six years, and there are no additional requirements for memberships. When you flip over to the Type B, the only differences are down here in the last uh, area, they are three members do not have to be a city official. Uh, however, of that, uh, if their community population is over 20,000, you must reside in the city. And if you're a community that is less than 20,000, as long as you're a county resident. So... I don't know, do any of y'all ever have any experiences with your type B boards and your communities? No? Nope? Okay. So, again, I'm not gonna read this to you. It's just more in a chart form of showing it 
um, the expenditure flexibility for type A versus type B. And then of course, what I think is important for, to walk away here with, do you notice here in popularity? Oh, uh, and this is as of about May or June of this year. Um, I have friends, uh, uh, works with type, he works with the state comptroller's office and they keep track of all the type A and type B uh, designations that are out there in the communities. And you can see there are 220 cities in the state of Texas that identify as a type A, whereas in type B, there's 506. And then again, and within that mix, some of them are both and some are none. So with that in of itself, again, type B is more popular because you have more flexibility and leeway. And then, of course, the big thing here talks about public hearings. So when you do want to get a project approved, it just talks about the differences. Type A does not have to actually have the public hearing, whereas the type B does. And then, of course, again, A, you don't have to have the right of the voter petition on your projects, but obviously you do on B. And there's no waiting period on A where there is on B. So you can see how they complement each other. And in my, uh, the communities that I've had that opportunity to work in, when there are both, they can be so complementary to each other and make a lot of things happen. So, all of this is going on. You've got business development, community development. You have boards that are in place that serve at the pleasure of the city council. And all of this is to grow your community in a planned manner so that you've got that best quality of life. You have that skilled workforce. And all around this, the whole time you have your economic developers, whether they're an arm of the city that they work in or part of the EDC. And just quickly, I'm gonna throw up there, a lot of times people have said EDC directors or economic development managers, this is some of their hats that they wear, just a few. And it may sound silly, but really it's all of the above. They're your champion, definitely bridge builders and at times keep peacekeeper. Uh, Big time also, they're selling your community. They are marketing your community nonstop. Obviously, they have to be able to be trusted. They have to also have that title of confidant. They've got to do a lot of research. So it's not your typical eight to five job. If you're, if you just ever wonder what all do they do, these are a few, just a very high, and it's supposed to be a little bit funny because we know how critical it is that the economic developer is right there in the middle, staying on top and ahead of the curve so that that community does not miss out on an opportunity that could be coming their way. So obviously the board and the councils, you can see it's oversight times, uh, they're, they are that visionary. So for any of you, are there any of you in here that sit on boards in your communities in the Brazos Valley? Okay, I've got two, three, all righty. Anything you wanna share with your group that y'all provide as a support factor to your EDC or your city? The board that I'm on now is a, is a chamber board. And so we, we work closely with them just in local businesses that we currently have mm -hmm. and just sharing things that they're telling us from you know what we hear and what we can do better and, and things like that collaboration yeah definitely thank you all righty and then of course okay so we talked a little bit me and this clicker I apologize we talked about a little bit what is economic development, what are the types of economic development, as well as what are the boards comprised of and those requirements. And let's go ahead and talk about now, what is the importance of having a community profile? We heard earlier this morning, it's about marketing your community. And the, the indexing that uh, was presented earlier this morning, I think by Mr. Spencer Clements, if not mistaking, or maybe it wasn't him, it was uh, the gentleman that the other gentleman from Texas A&M, when he was presenting it, he was talking about always knowing where is your, you know, where are you at in gross domestic product shipping and what is your unemployment rate, things of that nature. Well, having a strong community profile that definitely assists you when you are looking at attracting or recruiting new businesses. So what goes into a community profile? Well, first of all, you look at what makes your community unique. You look at people, place, values of that community or that region, as well as interaction. That all goes into that community profile as you start building it. And that's just at that highest level. You've got to be able to 
get your community to stand out. What is so special about the Brazos Valley that people want to come and live, work, and play here? And then, of course, so why do we analyze and profile? Well, by organizing information in your communities in a format, it allows prospects to go out to the website. A lot of us all know that prospects and site selectors, they're just looking for ways to eliminate you. That is the quickest thing they're trying to do. And so by having a very strong, robust community profile out there, it allows them to not mark you off. And I don't mean this disrespectfully, as quickly. Uh, you have to have a strong profile to stay in the hunt. And so also by having a community profile, you and your community, your EDC board, you can make better strategic decisions. Of course, it allows you to better understand where are those strengths, those weaknesses, how do you turn them into those opportunities. Likewise, you can keep track with what's going on in your local economy. You can keep your thumb on it. And better yet, it does serve as a benchmark for you to be able to know where do you rate to these other communities? We saw this morning Austin, Houston, Dallas. Well, Bryan College Station, we're number two. And although we may not be, it was 309%, we're at 217. And so we're, we're definitely making an impression. And so, of course, it also helps um, the economic development corporations and the boards to help set those priorities by having an up-to-date community profile. So, you can see this, what all goes into it, your labor market information, your building, what, what are your available sites that are already built out, ready to go. Also, quality of life, schools, cultural events, education, institutes of higher education, as well as the biggie incentive packages. We all know that when you have site selectors looking at you on behalf of actual new uh, prospects, they're wanting to know, well, what are you going to do for me if I come to your community? So, again, I mentioned already, and I know the Brazos Valley EDC is doing this, as well as a lot of the communities I work in around the Brazos Valley. Publish it. Get it out there on your website. I don't think that there are any communities anymore that do not have a website presence, but even as um, within the last five years, I've actually worked with a few communities and I said you will never, nothing is going to change until you do get with the times and you've got to have that digital presence. And then also of course um, by having all of that information I just shared uh, right here and this is just a few of it, by having all of that in your marketing package that way those when those site selectors are going through and looking at it they're like check, 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 they've got all of these uh, specific areas that we have to have. Then you can also use it to customize to very specific proposals, and that'll allow you to do it in record time because you can't start over every time recreating the wheel. Because those, as we know, RFPs and RFAs, they want them like tomorrow, and you got it, and it's 4:30. <laughs> so, and also you can look at what are your target industry opportunities, those high job demand occupations. What, what is the labor market sharing with you? Where is the trend going? And what is needed in your area and in your region? And then of course, distributing this information. And I think by having the, the forum, I know by having this forum this year, this is one way to distribute what's going on in Brazos Valley and the EDC. And they, they, along with each of your communities, you're out there educating your citizens, your local leaders, whether they're formal or informal. That is all because we're all champions right now. We are marketing to someone we don't even know about. When they come in and they say, so do you like Bryan College Station? Um, or is there anywhere, play, anywhere good here to eat? I've worked in communities where, you know, I just become uh, just a regular person eating. Oh, you don't want to eat here. You want to go down to the next town. They, we don't have nothing here. Oh, my gosh. You're just sending, you know, prospects down the road, whether they just really came there to eat or they may be looking to set up shop there. So just remember, you're champions, and you're always selling your community. So workforce development. Would y'all say that that is the essential component in workforce development? We've got to have prepared workers so that we can attract new industry or, and retain our existing businesses. Have any of y'all already been experiencing any of the lack of skilled workforce in your communities? Ah, yes, 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 yes. Oh, there go all the hands. Right. That right there is what keeps everyone up at night right now. And uh, we're going to talk about some different resources that are in place to hopefully 
facilitate that. And But again, with foreign direct investment and both just homegrown domestic uh, investors, they're like, if you don't have that skilled workforce, we love you, but we're going on down to the next bigger market that can help us or that can readily get that talent. So, and this is one of the biggest resources. I know that we, I saw uh, TWC, uh, Matt, I saw him earlier today. I don't know if he's in the room or not, but also they do provide, real quick, the breakdown is they're here to help your communities. They really are. Uh, Texas Workforce Commission, they oversee 28 local workforce boards, and I also met some individuals from Brazos Valley Workforce Solutions earlier this morning. And in Texas, obviously, most of us are representing the Brazos Valley region, so we all know that we have a satellite office in each of our counties. And if not, let me know, and I'll be glad to let you know where your satellite office is. And the purpose of those are is to offer fully integrated services in these uh, workforce satellite offices, and so it's not just a co-location with Health and Human Services. It is to actually help these individuals find out where are their strengths, you know, if, if they've been laid off, no fault of their own, how can they get back into a job as quickly as they can, or better yet, learn a new skill if theirs has been phased out altogether and they don't want to move to another community. Also, it allows that seamless access, as I indicated, to a full range of employment. A few of these, these are also incentives, and we'll see them on a few uh, subsequent slides. TWC, they do offer statewide customized training programs for employers, both existing and new ones. So if you've got, and I'm just gonna use this for grins and giggles, if you have an employer that wants to, a foreign direct employer that wants to bring in 100 CNC machinists, and we don't, we don't have 100 that are uh, certified in CNC, to be able to operate those machines. You can get with the TW, your local community college in our service district area, that's Blinn. And Teeks works very closely with Blinn so that you can put together a customized skills development grant. Those are traditionally for employers of 100 or more. And it's very customized by, by default. In other words, it's what those employers need. Likewise, and this is also used as an incentive, but it's a win-win because you're increasing the skill levels of the workers, which in turn usually becomes helps them career helps their career and be able to promote. The skills for small business, it's the same. These trainings are offered by both uh, community colleges and TEKS, and it's traditionally for businesses less than 100, as well as then the self-sufficiency fund. That one is actually geared more towards individuals who may have been out of the workforce for an extended amount of time, or more importantly, they're brand new and they have no work experience either. This one gives them more of that, let's learn the basics first and keep moving. And I did not add it up there. Something else TWC has really latched on to, and I'll be glad to uh, share more offline, is the apprenticeship trainings now that they're offering. They have a veterans training to be able to get vets back into the civilian workforce. So be aware, TWC is there to help our employers and which helps our communities thrive. So. Quickly, just to let y'all know, when you have nothing better to do at night and you're just doing this on your phone, right, the scrolling, if you, if you do decide to go out to the Texas Workforce Commission's website, there is an, on the navigation bar the Texas Industry Profile. This is very important for your community profiles because you can do it by your region. You can look up your local employment dynamics all the way down to occupational clusters and as well as the workforce supply and availability. So I'm not going to stay long on that. Just know it's also sitting out there on the TWC website for you. So... Obviously, our local workforce board here is Brazos Valley, and they work very closely with TWC. And we have Ms. Betty Russo here from the Department of, uh, where is Ms. Betty Russo? Is she in here? She's, she just stepped out. Well, she's with the Governor's Office of Economic Development and Tourism, and she and I are partners in crime. And that is her role is to work with local economic development organizations, help identify, you know, where are there any potentials uh, as well as get out there and uh, I want when she comes back in I'm gonna put her on the spot that's what she gets for stepping out as well as other resources of course TDA where appropriate in a lot of the rural communities there are a lot of different resources that can help you out in that respect and of course I've talked about education and training resources with the community colleges and of course TEKS again the big thing is all of these are layering to help your community be prosperous 
And so now we're going to get into, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're going to get into what are the components and the tools. We're going to talk a little bit about each of these uh, the, and their importance and what are they. You keep hearing business retention and expansion. Well, the reasons that is so critical is if we're not taking care of our homegrown, they're not, they're not going to stay. They will move out. And more importantly, those other prospects, they will call your uh, existing uh, employers. You will never know of it. And they're going to say, hey, you know, do they check on you? Are they, help, are they listening and identifying any needs that you have? And no, we're out here on, our, on an island unto ourselves. Trust me, your BR&E, that right there, it shows that you in your leadership role, whether formal or informal, you've got a commitment to your economic health of your region. Likewise, it shows a vested interest in your quality of life. You don't want to become status quoville. Um, of course, it sends that message, as I indicated, to new businesses of positive growth and prosperity because if you're retaining your businesses and they make up over 83% of your, of your businesses and your employment in town, believe it or not, are those existing businesses. And then, of course, uh, existing businesses, they are your best ambassadors. And it is the best return on investment, as I indicated. These right here, a lot of times economic developers uh, and their board members, they'll get both formal volunteers and formal volunteers. They'll set up a formal uh, business retention expansion program. And what is the, the whole guys is to get out there check in and say, thank you for having your plant here. Thank you for investing in Brazos Valley. And uh, what, what's been going on, I'm just here to say hello and thank you. We appreciate you having you. As well as they may need help with business plans and you can provide those resources and get those groups together. You can identify those a lot of those potential funding sources that we went over earlier. Obviously, you can find out if you can help develop a business-to-business -business mentoring or executive mentoring program. Of course, you may find out you may be able to target a complementary industry to that if you've got a manufacturer. And what they're making, they need someone that can package it, things like that. Um, that's a great way to both expand your, what the needs of your existing employer as well as bring in a new employer with new jobs. Also, they may be wanting to expand, but they have no way to grow. And you can assist them by saying, if you've got your, uh, for any of those, do any of y'all have um, in industrial parks that are already infrastructured out? Or, yes, no, okay, I see some hands going on. Just remember, if and when uh, someone ever asks, do you have an industrial park? And, and I say this because I also work out in rural Texas a lot. And you take them by and you show them a cow pasture. That is not the future site of an industrial. It's just not because it hasn't been infrastructured out. And they can't wait for all the funding and the paperwork as we know. So start thinking. And that's part of that strategic visioning that all of us are required to perform in order so that we can land more of those uh, or be able to take care of our existing employers and provide them more room. Obviously, we talked about uh, some of the some of suppliers, customers. Uh, of course, then you do serve as that liaison between the businesses and taxing entities. A lot of times, once you've built trust with your employer and you are let them know you're there for them and you definitely want them to be successful, they may share something with you that you would have had no other way to know because you're not going to necessarily get you know, their tax statements and um, you may be able to make a difference in that respect. The biggest thing is, though, perform BRNE. And I'm not saying with the survey, do not push them an electronic survey, y'all. I know I don't. I will. I do not necessarily, I do not normally fill out electronic surveys. But if someone comes to me and says, I'd like to visit with you and get your feedback, and I'm talking about an economic development standpoint, I will sit down and I will visit with them. They're just, it's that face to face because they're not going to do it. They don't have time. That gets put to the back burner. Um, something also, a lot of times, We've all seen this, whether we're reading the newspaper early in the morning or watching the 6 o'clock news. You didn't even know the company was at risk. And it wasn't because you weren't doing anything right, uh, anything wrong, but you find out through the 6 o'clock news, employees go to get their check and they shut down. Oh, my gosh. You know, and that right there, no one wants that to happen in their community because then that's loss of employment and, the, and then they're dispersed and everything that goes with that. So, of course, part of your role in economic development to take care of your existing businesses is stay aware of local activity. 
what's the traffic like in their parking lots? Do they have a lot of cars or not as many cars? Has there been a recent ownership change? Not that that's a bad thing, but a lot of times that can also indicate of other things that may be in the pipeline. Also watching the labor activity. I uh, know a lot of times uh, manufacturers, if they don't have enough production to keep them busy, they send home their employees on a 30, 32 hour work week. And that right there, that can start a lot of, you know, unhappy, disgruntled workers because they too have bills to pay. Um, just so by having a BRE program, you're keeping your thumb on and letting your employer know, hey, we're here for you, we're here to help you. And then of course, monitoring the market of that industry. And the lights are beeping, I bet it's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then of course, monitoring the industry. And then believe it or not, sometimes regulatory burdens, then they will cause an existing business to just end up folding shop because they cannot comply or be able to afford all of the requirements necessary. So we've talked about BRNE, the importance, economic development marketing. A lot of us were next door right before lunch. Um, went, if you didn't go to busting the myths of entrepreneurship, you went to the digital marketing. And of course, this is so important. And it, it folds back into the community profile. You've got to have that digital presence to be able to sell your community, you have to. And I'm one of those, uh, in whoever else was in that, um, a seminar before lunch, they talked about, yeah, if you're the, the older side of the generation is at X and you're 55, you're just about Facebook and that's about all you really are, that's all you're really going to ever be. <laughs> but anyhow, with that in mind though, you've got to be able to have, I just went the wrong way, sorry, you've got to be able to have that digital presence again and market your community. You've got to develop the message uh, to share what are your, both your natural and your acquired assets. A lot of us have a lot of natural assets, whether it's water or land. And some of the acquired assets, you know, that could be um, exposition center, fairgrounds, things that you necessarily that could help you have that competitive advantage. So think of it in that standpoint. What is your competitive advantage and how are you going to market it? And then, of course, so what you're doing, you're persuading those potential investors to look at your community or your region. So where do you start? Who do you want to be? What, you know, who are you selling? What are you selling? So understanding your product. And this is, some of this is basic marketing for those of you who are familiar with it. Establishing those expectations. In other words, don't make them so far overarching that you're never going to be able to reach them within uh, eight to 12 months at, uh, at the most, at least from a marketing standpoint. And that's a long time to not have your plan out there and uh, executing it. And then, of course, developing it. And, of course, you have to agree upon a budget. None of us are, we're all, we all have line items, and it's all very taut. We don't have an unlimited, infinite amount of budget dollars for marketing. So you definitely want it to count. So doing your homework and all that research up front, that will be beneficial for you as you do take on your economic uh, marketing standpoint. So these are just a few of the th ways that you can increase your marketability. It's common sense, you know, of course. Um, we've, we've seen all the benefits of redevelopment of downtowns uh, all across the state, not just here in the Brazos Valley. Also, having that uh, improved workforce skills, which is having those employees with those uh, correct workforce skills that are necessary in the area. And then, of course, having those built industrial parks, as I talked about a little bit earlier, that are already ready to go, and offering, obviously, incentives. And believe it or not, there have been some companies that have looked at the Brazos Valley. And although they said, well, yeah, yeah, y'all got Aggie football, but, you know, granted, we've come a long way. And I'm, I'm going back a few years now. They wanted more cultural experiences. And, of course, Austin, Dallas, Houston, are, and we're in the middle of the Texas Triangle. So don't think that we don't lose out at times due to that, the amenities. Because when these employers say, I'm bringing in 100 people, they want to know that those kids are going to go into good schools and that if you have a trailing spouse, that they're going to be able to ascertain employment if that's part of their family dynamic, along with, you know, what are the, what, what are the amenities and what does that quality of life look like? So, again, you're selling your community and you're doing this digitally. And, of course, who are you? Developing your brand. I know I'm running out of time. And it needs to be cohesive and fine-tuning that message. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see 
a lot of these websites, they go on and on about what is their mission statement, and it's not, it's not very succinct. <laughs> it goes on and on, and you just make, make it short and make it concise, and that'll, that'll prove who you are, and that'll get your brand out. Lastly, on business recruitment, and in, uh, AKA business attraction, and we're gonna talk about the incentives and programs. Quickly, this just traditionally talks about a company considers relocation, then they get, they may, a lot of times they'll get with their site selection consultants. They will contact your state or regional economic development group. And then at that point, they will get in touch with the local economic development organization, whether that's through the city or through a regional group. And then, of course, you just see it starts flowing down. And they're, they're definitely like, they've already looked at your community profile online and they've determined that they are not marking you off the list yet. So, this comes out, I got these from my good friends. I work very closely, as I said, with uh, downtown Austin at the Office of Economic Development and Tourism. And so this is traditionally, uh, when the company, they'll contact state office there in downtown Austin and then their reps. And if Betty was in here, I'd point her out again, she'll get on the contact with her region and she primarily serves the Gulf Coast and up into East Texas. This is just more factoid, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Again, I um, got this through, uh, through Austin. The advantages of 100 new jobs, traditionally just uh, speaking, on average, that aggregate personal income is, becomes 3.5 million. As a result, there is the likelihood that retail businesses, you will, you will be able to garner five new retail businesses. Then you just see how it goes down. 103 new non-manufacturing jobs will be associated with it. You'll have an increase of about 202, so that doubles. Your family units, which are housing that you're gonna need, and school enrollment goes up. And look at the bottom one, retail sales at 1.2 million just from for having 100 new jobs in your, in your community region. But correspondingly, you have challenges. And we talk about this. You know, if we, if we don't have the quality education, if we don't have the infrastructure to be able to support this new growth, these are the strains. These are the areas that we'll put a strain on. So just be aware, it's, you know, it's a balancing act and it's not easy. So what you're doing out there, uh, what you're a part of, it is a continue, it's constant. It's just a continuation of being able to provide everything everybody needs. And of course, everyone's staying happy all the time. And I'm being very facetious. Something else, uh, just because it's such a competitive market when you're looking at recruiting a business to your community, I, it's just worth saying. And again, this is something that I work with with my counterpoints uh, down in Austin. This is the scenario. Uh, each year in the U.S., 2,500 location projects are pursued over by 25,000 EDOs. The odds of success are 1 in 10, which is every 10 years, maybe 1. And then of that 2,500, 75% of all these locations are in urban areas with the remaining 25% in rural areas. And again, you see the breakdown. What are the odds of success? Those odds continue to increase. It gets harder and harder, as you see. And then lastly, 90% of all locations employ less than 100 employees. That's not a bad thing. That's just a reality. So if you want a company with 100 or more employees, this is, these are the odds. It even increases threefold. Um, so if you're in an urban area, if you're wanting to get that large manufacturer with over 100 employees, 100 jobs it's going to create, you might get three you might get one every 133 years. Or if you're in a rural area, maybe once in 400 years. So quickly, site selection factors still at the top of the list are your highway accessibilities, labor costs, and skilled labor, and quality of life, and then it goes on down, but you can still see what is driving it up at the, the if you will, your top five. And in that top five, you round out with quality of life and tax exemptions. That right there is critical when business attraction, when you're trying to land that new uh, company. Quickly, because I'm out of time. These are the incentives that so many EDOs utilize when they are trying to court and bring a new company to town, obviously local. Texas Enterprise Fund, that's called the deal closing fund that you have to work with the governor's office with that one. Uh, of course, there's the traditional property tax, tax abatements. Uh, chapter 380 and 381, that's more like a 
you go ahead and you can have clawbacks uh, and provisions put in those uh, right there. 380 is for city, 381 is for counties. And traditionally, you have in your performance agreement, whatever what you want them to deliver, they still pay their taxes, but then you, if you will, it's like a tax rebate. You can give them a rebate on taxes. And in that way, you're not left holding the bag. Whereas sometimes on tax abatement, if there's, they don't have to do anything and perform for it, you know, you could be left um, holding, holding that ticket. Of course, the tax increment financing is also known as TERS, Tax Increment Reinvestment Zones. That's where they focus on certain parts of communities that need to be redeveloped, that may be in blight, and they use public financing to be able to accomplish that. And then as they start paying it back, they're able to take those revenues from that TERS, from that uh, geographic designated area, and that's how they pay it back to be able to get um, companies and manufacturers to move into that area or even retail. For, of course, free port exemptions, that's inventory for companies that as long as you're not holding your own inventory for, for less than 175 days, you won't be taxed on it. So to have that exemption, that's always very enticing. Likewise, we know the type A, type B, you can have a quarter of a cent, an eighth of a cent, or even half a cent. And those, right, like I said, those two can be used to leverage incentive packages. County assistance districts, those right there can be, they're in addition to, and they're run by the county commissioner's court. Those right there, you can have taxes where you've got like your own maintenance group that is out there taking care of roads and other types of maintenance otherwise that like your infrastructure couldn't handle. And those are, they're in the, they're in the state, but they're not that, uh, they're not that popular, I think because most people don't know about them. Last but not least, enterprise zones, those you have to partner with the state of Texas. And in order to do that, you have to be in a geographically area of distress. And you make your you put in your application, and if the state approves you, they will allow you for those eligible projects to come back in and you can get a rebate on that, if you will, or a refund. So this right here, believe it or not, prop, these incentives are very, very enticing to uh, new companies. They don't always work, and there's always a blend of them. Oh, and I almost forgot Chapter 313. That's where it just for up to 10 years they're going to freeze that school tax value uh, on that for that company, and the companies like that a lot. Um, these are some more. We've talked about the more financing. You can also help companies out by taking out industrial revenue bonds. Of course, you have your hotel, motel, local and state loan programs. They have revolving loan fund programs through the state as well as we talked about extensively training grants and wage subsidies, and those can also be administered through the Department of Labor, through the uh, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. And last but not least, foreign trade zones. For those of you who were around quickly, when they first came out, there was like 36 of them, and everybody was trying to get a foreign trade zone. Well, there have been new updates now. You can have subzones activated, so they can be turned on and off. That is a good thing for companies who are wanting to come in, and they're, they're importing it from outside the United States, and they're not paying taxes. If you will, it's just it's passing through. So to be able to have this type of incentives for companies, you always have to be thinking, what else can we lure them to our community with? And these, as I said, I know it's not all exhaustive, but these are several of them. And, of course, last but not least, we've all heard of heads and beds. The hotel occupancy tax just talks about that that tax can be imposed uh, not to exceed 7%. And you can use this to promote your local tourism in sports venues, uh, any types of venues of that nature. I went through this quickly, but if you take anything away, take care of what your homegrown is, please. And it's not an event. What we do, it's a process. It's ever, it's evergreen. It's always you're making adjustments. So ED is a process. It's not an event. And Definitely your community, not just you as those leaders, but if you can get your community on board, that is critical if you're going to be able to be successful. Uh, you have to have, they have to be committed in time and money resources, and they're selling your community. Learn to use good ideas from other. The Brazos Valley, we're doing a great job. We can do even better from a regional standpoint to hold ourselves out to the state and to foreign direct investors as this region. That's what they look for. Where's that labor shed supply coming from? And of course, last but not least, celebrate all your successes in a big way. I'm sorry I went over. Um, anyone have any questions? Other than I know you drank from a water hose, my apologies. Did it, if I may ask this, just so I'll know, 
Is some of it, okay, that's what I was thinking, or, oh, that's new, I didn't know about that. Uh, so, because I don't know what level some of y'all are at in this room wh when it comes to economic development. Anyone? Yes. No, I actually I only have a comment. Actually, my colleague and I, we were with Workforce Solutions. Yes. So we, <laughs> yes, we were the ones you spoke to. I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you relaying that information to the, to the larger audience. Absolutely, I thank you. That is one of the most important things that we've got to address because if you look at school systems, starting from the first grade to the fifth grade, they don't know math. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, uh, it's unbelievable, particularly with the uh, minorities that we have coming in. and They don't know math and they don't know English. So we've got workforce solutions has got to be a real answer for us, for, or at least it is in our community. Thank you for echoing that. Anyone else? Well, I appreciate your attention and thank y'all. Our thanks to Water to Wine Productions for recording this breakout session replay from the 2018 Brazos Valley Business Forum. This video was presented in part by The Bank and Trust. More information on the Brazos Valley Economic Development Corporation and its mission can be found at brazosvalleyedc.org. We also invite you to be part of Invest Brazos Valley, the BVEDC's private sector voice in growing our communities.